This man uh, loves God, he loves us, and he loves humanity and Jesus Christ enough to share his story. Uh, many people have been delivered from uh, many things, and things that God has delivered us from that may cause the ire of society or may cause people to look at us askance, we, which, is, which is your choice, we tend to take those things and bury them, never to mention them again, even if it could possibly help someone else. Uh, there are just some things that are so painful that you would just rather leave where they are. And then there are souls like Walt Hyatt, who says, if I can help someone with this powerful story of redemption, if I can share something that will deliver someone else and destroy a yoke, I will do it. And I think that takes tremendous courage and tremendous manhood. I'm going to ask if you would to please stand and receive my friend, Walt Heyer, as he comes to share his story. Would you please come, sir? All right. Thank you all so much. You can sit down and we'll get going. It's what a pleasure it is for me to be here to share the power and grace of Jesus Christ, because that's what my story is about. It's not so much about me as it is about what the power and grace of Jesus Christ can do when we're not defiant toward the Lord and are ready to receive him as our savior and walk the rest of our days with the Lord. So um, what I'm going to do tonight is kind of tell you my story, but I'm going to weave it into some of the current day things. I'm going to try to, I've given this message actually uh, in Italy. I've been on television in Russia, uh, around the world, in Australia and other places in Canada. And so um, I, I want you to have this and I hope that it touches someone in a way that uh, if you think you're struggling with something and, and um, you know, you can't work your way out of it, I want you to know no matter what it is, that Lord of ours, that power can bring us right back to where I am, restored and redeemed to serve him. Make no mistake. I can tell you from my 70 years of firsthand life experience, transgenders are not equal in function or purpose to a biological correct male or female. Transgenders represent man's cosmetics, masquerades, and are only a facsimile but not of God. They're made of man. I stand before you tonight as God's redeemed and restored witness to this very truth. With my breath, I share with you my life and my testimony before God. The activists push for transgender rights to advance an agenda to destroy God's biologically correct gender identities. It is a deliberate and willful attempt for the destruction of correct males and correct female genders, all designed to erode, uh, erode and undermine the fundamental core of the church and every family in the church. Transgenderism threatens families no matter what color, no matter what country, no matter what language is spoken, they threaten us all. We must stand together under the siege of this attack on our church and on the biblical truth of who really makes men and women. It's God, not surgeons. Amen. Not only that, we must stand united, glorifying Jesus Christ without compromising any biblical truths. No doubt, no doubt 
Don't doubt me on this. The truth is, God's design of biblical, biological women and biological men is being torn to shreds by a radical transgender movement. The transgender activism is a real threat and danger to all of us. We must shout out the glory of Jesus, engage in prayer and love for our Lord and Savior. We must love the broken transgenders, embrace them, but not celebrate and glorify their life. We can get to know people who are gender confused, and we should embrace them so that we can discover if they're willing to admit and be willing to turn their life over to Jesus Christ. If they're defiant toward God's redemptive power, then we will struggle to help them. But we can talk to the defiant and gently exhort them, confront them with the truth, standing in opposition of their life as a transgender, using the weight of Scripture, all the time praying that they will bend under the weight of Scripture and truth, turning their defiance into obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, falling on their knees before the Lord, rebuking transgenderism. This is a difficult and confusing subject for all of us. Self-identified transgenders, believe me, are struggling, I can tell you. They're hurting, and they're lost in a false identity. I will share with you my 70-year journey in brief and provide the real story of God's grace and power. Yes, I was one of the lost. I was in the transgender wilderness. Thankfully, a turning point came to my story that turned my life around, a turning point that allowed me to leave the transsexual life for a new life in Christ. Today, my life, as you can see, is restored. It's robust. It's abundant. It's blessed because I serve the Lord with every breath and every day. But my life was redeemed and restored because I did not stand in defiance of Christ saying that God made me that way. We hear that a lot, don't we? And we all know that's wrong. We know that surgeon did it on a table. God didn't make that mistake. But he's there to pick up the pieces. That is if we turn to Jesus. <laughs> what redemption was for me and how that came about is that I have a lovely wife. Almost 20 years now. I was a drug addict and an alcoholic. Today I stand before you with over 30 years of clean and sober living. So not only did I turn to the Lord and break the bondage of transgenderism, drug, drug addiction, and alcoholism, um, I lived this free life away from the transgender ideology now for 25 years. But my, thank you. Back in June of this year, um, I was having some difficulty in my esophagus. And I went to the doctor, and they performed eight hours and 40 minutes of surgery on me because they found cancer. That was June 14th of this year. Look at this. Here I am. The Lord can heal anything. Tonight, as we engage in this discussion about transgenderism, we're doing so at a very critical time, aren't we? Yes, sir. Very critical time. We're all being threatened by it, whether it's in our public schools, 
or in our communities, in our jobs. And so this is a great time to have this discussion. That's why tonight we want to take a different look, and I call it rethinking transgenderism. Tonight we will explore the question, can a young person's youth and natural gender curiosity be wrongly identified by parents and doctors as transgenderism? Are people born as transgenders, or is this desire to change genders the direct result of an event, a loss, abuse, or some uncommon occurrence that just is so difficult they don't want to be who they are? Probably all of those things come into play in the transgender life. My testimony of 70 years, you could sit, sit there tonight and go, well, it's just one person. He doesn't really represent the entire transgender movement that they have. So you could dismiss me and say, well, he's an exception. Yeah, of course I am. I know Jesus. But let me give you a couple of other examples to put my life into context with what is really going on that you won't find on the television because they won't allow me to be on television in the U.S. I can be on television in Russia. Russia came to my house in Arizona and filmed a documentary and put it on in Russia. I've been on in Russia three times because they're interested. I've been on television in the UK and Australia because they're interested. Because they don't mind having a voice that's in opposition. Well, let me tell you. I'll share with you what one highly skilled doctor said about transgender patients that he had treated himself. So we can listen to his testimony and weave it into my own. His name was Dr. Charles Illenfeld. He was an endocrinologist. He worked at a prominent gender clinic in New York for six years. He had administered cross-gender hormone therapy to some 500 transgenders. Dr. Illenfeld's job was to assist the patients in what we call gender transitioning. His six years experience yielded some important findings that we should know. Dr. Illenfeld had been working with none other than Dr. Harry Benjamin, who was the guy who was the founder in this country of transgenderism. He had done this medical treatment at his clinic for years. Benjamin was even the one who coined the word transsexual. His colleague, Dr. Ellenfeld, notes in an article in the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Mental Health in 1972, Benjamin had diagnosed and treated and befriended at least 1,000 of transgender, Amer uh, transsexual people in the U.S., 1,000. The well-respected Dr. Ellenfeld, this endocrinologist, gave his report to a bunch of doctors, psychologists, and others who were treating other people who identified as transgenders. He sounded a warning about using hormone therapy on individuals who were changing genders. He concluded after six years and 500, working with 500 transgender people, this is what he said. Wouldn't you like this to be on the 5 o'clock news? He said, in his conclusion, there is too much unhappiness among people who have changed genders. He also said there are too many suicides after people change genders. He also concluded that 80% of the people 
who wanted to change their gender shouldn't do it. Then he really hit the button, the 20% that were left. He concluded a change in genders at best, at best, would only be a temporary reprieve, not a lifelong solution. Dylan Feld said these things in 1979, yet many of the current gender trends today find too much unhappiness, too many suicides with people who have been changing genders. So what we know is it's not working. It's not working. My own personal life experience is proof. Dr. Illenfeld was correct in 1979, and the activists have willfully been ignoring the tragic outcomes of suicide, unhappiness, and regret since 1979. If my testimony is not convincing enough, or Dr. Illenfeld's warning is not powerful enough for, for us to rethink transgenderism and its effect on people, I'm going to take another step. Let's look, because you were talking about young people, let's talk about the American College of Pediatricians, a prestigious group. The American College of Pediatricians published a position statement in March of 2016. So now we've got Illenfeld in 79. I'm bringing forth to you tonight as part of this testimony what we have in March of 2016. Please take note, my friends. This is the kind of thing that should be on our televisions, should be in our schools. They won't allow it. This is what we should be talking about, but they won't allow it because it's the truth. The truth has become quite unpopular. The American College of Pediatrician urges educators and legislators to reject all policies that condition children to accept as normal, a life of chemical and surgical impersonations of the opposite sex. Facts, not ideology, determine reality. The American College of Pediatrician finds today gender identity harms children and, in my view, is child abuse. I was a child of four that was abused by it. College of Pediatrician goes on to say, a person's belief that he or she is something they are not is at best a sign of confused thinking. When an otherwise healthy biological boy believes he is a girl or an otherwise healthy biological girl believes she's a boy, an objective psychological problem exists that lies in the mind, not in the body, and should be treated as such. Rates, the second thing they said, rates of suicide are 20 times greater among adults who have used cross hormones and undergo sex reassignment surgery, even in Sweden, which is among the most LGBT affirming countries in the world. What compassionate and reasonable person would condemn young children to this fate knowing that after puberty, 88 to 98 percent of the boys and girls would eventually grow out of the state of gender dysphoria, no longer having that desire? How criminal is it to begin transitioning young people before they have an opportunity to develop to that point. We're interceding before they ever have that opportunity. That's what happened to me. Conditioning children into believing that a lifetime of chemical and surgical impressions of the opposite sex 
is normal and healthful is by their definition, American College of Pediatricians, child abuse. Endorsing gender discord as a public education policy and or legal policy will confuse children and parents, leading more children to present to gender clinics that they're confused where they will be given puberty-blocking drugs. This, in turn, will virtually ensure that they will choose a lifetime of cross-gender toxic hormones and likely consider a totally unnecessary surgical manipulation of their body as young adults. That should alarm us. So if my testimony is not enough as proof, and Dr. Illenfeld's warning falls short, and then if the American College of Pediatricians just doesn't make it either. I got an email not too long ago from a young man that I'll share with you. My website, sexchangeregret.com, I get a lot of letters. Over 350,000 people came to visit my website last year. We've had the opportunity to intercede and, and, and actually engage with people who are struggling. And here's one of them. He writes, I transitioned to female beginning in my late teens and changed my name in my early 20s. That was over 10 years ago. But it wasn't right for me. I feel only discontent now in the female role. I was told, I was told, that my transgender feelings were permanent. We've heard that before. Immutable and physically deep-seated in my brain and could never change. And that the only way I would ever find peace was to become a female. He writes, the problem is I don't have those feelings anymore. When I began seeing a psychologist, a few years ago to help overcome some childhood trauma, remember? My depression and anxiety began to wane along with my transgender feeling. He was getting the treatment that he needed. He had psychological issues. So two years ago, I began contemplating going back to my innate gender. And he writes, it feels right to do so. I have no doubts now. I want to be a male again. He went on to say the surgeons removed my testicles. That happened before my male puberty had been completed. We talked about that as well. I have a little bit of facial hair, which I will never bother to have the electrolysis for. My breast, because of the hormone therapies have been developed and are tough to hide, so I will need surgery to get rid of them. The young man concluded by saying, the saddest thing of all, I can never have children, which I pray God will give me the strength to withstand that deep sadness. We're taking the lives of people. We're taking their futures. When we talk about what it does to the family, there's an example. The guy needed good psychological therapy, and he could have married some beautiful woman and raised children and given them a life. And he could have taught them some things, couldn't he? Rethinking transgenderism takes a look at the questions like, are transgenders born in the wrong body? Or are cross-dressers being confused with transgender? Can a child or a young person's curiosity about switching genders become a transgender obsession? Perhaps you've asked yourself, is the transgender condition 
psychological or emotional, or is it medical? For me, the seeds of transgenderism were planted at the age of four. I apparently made it known to my grandmother I wanted to dress a girl as a girl. Grandma took quickly to the idea of dressing me up to look like a girl. She was thrilled to see her young boy, grandson, dressed as a girl. So excited. She was supporting and encouraged me. She even made me a purple chiffon evening dress. You know, I was watching television. I always have this memory of what, what had happened to me as a young person, and I, I, I want as best I can, with as much as I have left, to try to prevent anybody else from going through this. And I, too, was watching a television show a year or so ago, and the TV camera's on, mom's at the, the dining table, the boy's facing the table, mom's combing the long hair of the boy, but the boy is identifies as a girl. The camera's talking to mom, and mom's talking about going to the doctor to get hormone blockers and how the kid goes to school dressed as a girl. And she, she was almost glowing with excitement. And it so reminded me of what I saw in my grandmother, that who is this really for? Who was it really for? Was this mom's dream? Was it my grandma's dream? Who would suffer the consequences? Not my grandma. Bless her heart. I loved her. She didn't know. But in this scene of the young boy sitting at the table, a mom combing the hair, and the, the interviewer of the program was asking mom many questions, and in a, in a most striking moment, it brought tears to my eyes. The young boy turned his head back, looked at mom, and said, Mom, would you love me if I was a boy? Does that run chills through you? I mean, what he was saying was, this wasn't his deal. This is not his deal. And I, that just burned into me like a branding iron on a cow, you know? Because that's, that's what happened to me. How do you stand up against the mother or the grandmother, whoever it is? You know, they've, they've developed this identity within this child at a young age. Many of them say, well, I've always been that way. Well, yeah, they started so young doing this to you, no wonder. And if a child today says, you know, anything about gender, the automatic click is because it's on television, it's on everything about transgender kids. they got TV shows with transgenders on them. They automatically think, my kid's a transgender. Tell me, how many transgender kids did you see 25 years ago? zippity doo -dah, right? I mean, now it's almost like, you know, you, you, the parents want to parade their transgender kid down to Starbucks like you would a, some kind of little doggy, right? I mean, it's crazy. We're manufacturing transgender kids out of madness. We're ignoring Jesus Christ, who's the one who actually makes gender. Young kids can be taught, influenced, and encouraged to become a transgender, just like I was, especially today, when it's far more fashionable than it was in 1944. When I said, 1944, that was a long time ago. My transgender seed was planted, and the fire burned in me as it got nurtured, encouraged by my grandmother. Thankfully, though, back in the 40s and 50s, there were no transgender activists to rob me of enjoying some of my normal male development in schools. But for that, I'm grateful. I ran track. 
I was a fast little guy, as a matter of fact. I played football, and the B football team was the kicker because no one could kick further than I could. The B team were the lightweight kids, were, and the heavy kids were on the varsity football team. I did remember one time when um, they got confused like kids do in school, and uh, we were down on, it was the only time we'd never scored, ever scored a point, our team. We got beat up by every other school. And the quarterback on our team, for some reason, left the field, and I was a blocking back, and they hiked the ball to me. I didn't know what to do with it. So I ran forward, and I think I had about, you know, I had the whole other team on top of me. I think I went about two steps and got crushed. So that was the end of my running career, one time, one ball, you know. So that was fun stuff back in those days, and I'm glad that wasn't robbed from me. But you know, one thing that people don't understand is I was not a homosexual. Many transgenders are not homosexual. We need to understand that there's an identity crisis of, of who we are, not about our sexuality. Sometimes that becomes very confusing. But sexuality is a part from an identity, a persona of what you present. So when people write to me and, and they want help about homosexuality, I, I have to tell them I, I really don't know about that. But I can tell you about transgenders, and I'm willing to do that. I was married at the age of 21. I was a bright guy, intelligent, had a strong desire toward success. After some college, I became an associate design engineer on the Apollo Space Missions, working at North American Aviation as an associate design engineer, working on NASA specifications. The inner circle inside me was a struggle, however, with my gender, even in my success. And it did not leave me alone for one day. I had to battle strong feelings, eventually turning to the drink, to numb that doggone old pain and that gal in that purple dress that kept coming back, telling me I needed to change. I had to battle those strong feelings. They just pestered me, almost like a radio playing in my head. My successful career in the aerospace industry transferred to the auto manufacturing business where I became an executive with American Motors, Renault, Honda, and a short time with Toyota. I was married to my first wife for about 15 years when I went to a PhD who specialized in diagnosing and treating individuals who struggled with gender identity. Now this guy is the guy who wrote the Harry Benjamin International Standards of Care. And those standards, in part, remain today as the standards. He was my approving doctor. He approved me saying that you have gender dysphoria and that you need hormone therapy and that you need to undergo gender reassignment surgery to resolve this conflict from gender dysphoria. I waited two years and still struggled. During that two-year period, the feelings got even more intense. I was even becoming more successful in my career. But that gal in that purple dress in my head would not play, stop playing, kept haunting me. I kept thinking I was born in the wrong body. I kept thinking I need that surgery. So I divorced my wife, and after two years, I went back to the same doctor. And I told him about what I was going through, and he said, now's the time. I'll give you another letter. All right. So in April 1983, I went to Trinidad, Colorado, and Dr. Stanley Biber, who had performed some 4,000 of these surgeries, 
at his clinic. Performed gender reassignment surgery on me. I was 42 years old. That was a tough time. The surgeon did provide cosmetic surgery, but I later learned when I studied more about it that no biology ever changed. It's like a Halloween costume that you do with surgery. And then you have to play out this role on the stage of life as though it's real. And there ain't nothing real about it. You know? Women, real women, are real. I'm here to tell you, I don't care how good a man looks in a dress or how much makeup he puts on, he ain't a woman. And they can carve him up like a Christmas turkey and do all they want with him. He ain't never going to become a woman. My 15-year career came swiftly crashing down after I told the company I was working for that I had that surgery, that very same old transgender story that I've heard many, many other people write and tell me about. Today, people who write me, some of them are physicians, airline pilots, teachers, college professors, bright people. But you know, intelligent people sometimes aren't real smart, right? Undergoing an, an unnecessary regimen of hormone therapy and surgery is very destructive, just like Dr. Ellenfeld said. He had it right. That was in 1979. I was first approved in 1981. I often wondered, why didn't the doctor who approved me give me Dr. Illenfeld's warning signs and have me sign that before he approved me? They don't do that. The problem is the reassignment surgery and hormones don't resolve psychological problems. And I wrote about that in my book, Paper Genders, which I have a few copies of here tonight. They have been trying for over 100 years. Surgeons have been trying for over 100 years to cure people's psychological and psychiatric ails with surgery. Guess what? It didn't work in the early 1900s. It didn't work when Dr. Walter Freeman used an ice pick in people's brains to do a frontal lobotomy. And it's not working today when they're cutting off people's body parts and stuffing hormones in them. I was terminated on October 25, 1983. That was my 43rd birthday. My career was over. I never found my way back from that day to any sound employment. For years, I did odd jobs. Worked for a catering company. I cleaned homes. I lived on the margins of life. And at one time, I was homeless. At one point, I was seeing a Christian therapist when I was suicidal, just like Dr. Ellenfeld said. The therapist had a friend named Roy who lived in Pleasanton, California, not far from San Francisco. Roy, a special guy was willing to have me come and live with his family. He had a crippled boy that had been hit by a car, and he had a young daughter. But yet he was willing to take this broken down old transgender into his home. He was a pastor, a loving pastor. His wife was a teacher, all in an effort to prevent me from committing suicide because that therapist told him, if I didn't get surrounded by a good family, I probably would. But even though I was living with that loving family, the pain from what I'd done, the loss that I was feeling, about how 
how I was so utterly selfish about using my life to better my life and not to glorify Jesus Christ and to not lift up my wife and to not be a father to my children. What a betrayal for a father to change his gender when the kids are in their teens. Horrible, a horrible thing to do. That is one of my deepest regrets. And that's why I have my website, Sex Change Regret. That's where that comes from, my kids. Oh, they're great kids. I was still using alcohol at the time I was living with that family. They, they decided that I should be in a small apartment downtown. And I ended up on top of a single-story building, drunk and ready to jump off the building and end it. And the cops talked me down, put me in jail. And I went to court, and the guy said, I'm not going to jail you, I'm not going to fine you, if you choose to go into recovery. So I went to see another therapist who had some pull and got me into a home, um, Women's Recovery Center in San Francisco. As a transgender, I went in there. And I was in that recovery home for four months. And eventually, started going to meetings, got started my journey from alcoholism. And I started going to church. Because they gave me the option, you can either go to church on Sunday or an AA meeting, and I was sick and tired of AA meetings, to be honest with you. They were making me go to two and three of those things a day, and, and I, wanted, I wanted a little bit more of Jesus. And so when I went into the pastor's office, because I wanted to talk to him about my life before I went to the church, and I sat down with Pastor Jeff, and I said, now look, I'm Laura, and I'm going to come to your church. I'm a transgender. And Roy had told him about it, but I said, you're not going to try to change me, are you? Kind of smiled, and he said, no, he says, my job's to love you. It's God's job to change you. And God changed me. It was, not a, it was not an easy journey. I struggled. I ended up in psychotherapy. They found out that I had a dissociative disorder from my childhood, which came out as I was in therapy. My grandmother, of course, did the cross-dressing. My dad wanted me to develop into a man. I mean, he was so scared about what was happening to me that he decided that discipline, heavy discipline with a hardwood floor plank would turn me into a man. It turned me into a lot of welts, and it hurt a lot. And when his adopted brother, a teenager, found out that I'd been wearing a dress, old Uncle Fred decided it, I'd be fair game for sexual molestations. So now I got grandma, I got dad's discipline, and I'm being sexually molested, and I haven't even got to 10 years old yet. I didn't have no therapy. I didn't know where to go, so I put it all inside. So I'm dealing with things between me and Jesus and now my therapist. I was writing down all these things uh, in the program of recovery about what went on in my early life with the therapist, and I had, I don't know how many sheets of paper, but they were yellow line paper, many of them. I was writing them all down, and I took them to him for a session. He said, we're going to stay here until we go through everything. We're not going to break until we're done. We went through everything that I talked about, all my pain, hurt, anger, and resentment. When we were done, we went outside in the parking lot. He held up that yellow line paper like this, we put a match to it, it lit it on fire, it burnt a gentle breeze, blew it away, it was gone. 
It was gone. We went back inside, and he says, time for us to pray. I wasn't much of a prayer person, you know. Two seconds was probably about as long as I could handle a prayer. He was a big prayer guy. So we started praying. I had my head down, and he's praying, and he's praying. And he's praying. He's still praying. And I'm thinking, boy, is he going to get this over with? I'm, I'm ready to go. And he's still praying. And there was a moment where I couldn't hear him. I know he was praying, but I couldn't hear him. And all of a sudden, standing before me was Jesus Christ. He had his arms stretched out like this. I could see the Lord's arms stretched out, and I could see a little baby wrapped in cloth. He grabbed a hold of that baby, and the Lord pulled him in and said, You will be safe with me forever. The prayer was over. And in that moments of prayer, I was redeemed and restored by the power and grace of Jesus Christ. Today, I live to serve Jesus Christ around the world. We reach, our ministry reaches 180 countries around the world. We've touched people in almost every country. There's only 210 countries in the world, so we're doing a pretty good job of getting out there. We reached over 300 million people on TV alone last year. Not so many in the U.S. So we're... We're serving the Lord, my wife and I. It's just us. We're not a 5013C. We travel. We got a car. We keep wearing them out. And uh, we are grateful for Bishop Wooden to invite me here tonight to share with you my testimony and my life. And remember, transgenders are man-made. Male and female are God-made. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Who wouldn't serve a God like our God? Let's give the Lord praises tonight. Hallelujah. Go. 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 I told you you would be blessed by this man of God. Please be seated for a moment. We we're open. To, if there are any questions or, or any comments, just for a few seconds, if there's anyone who would like to direct a question to. Walt, well, you may do so at this time. Just, just make them easy questions. <laughs> Amen. But I'm here for you. It's a great opportunity if you have a question. There we go. Okay. diagnosed you with a dissociative disorder, and I know that a multiple personality tends to fall in that category. I wanted to know what was your thoughts as it relates to transgenderism? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, there's dissociative disorders that don't rise to the level of multiple personalities, um, and transgenders, re according to research, roughly 30% of them suffer from dissociative disorders. And it's pretty easy to see that that can be true because they're dissociating from who they are to become someone who they're not. So it's, it's a simpler form of multiple personalities when there's really only two. That answer your question? Okay. Yeah. So 
Since grandmothers play such a major role in young kids' lives, how did you, um, did you ever get a chance to talk to your grandmother? Do you think it was just that she wanted a girl? Um, you know, what made her start doing that? And did you get a chance to kind of get some healing from her as to how she felt as to what it did to you? Yeah, once my parents, because it was a secret for two and a half years that grandma was dressing me this way when she was babysitting me, so my parents didn't know. So when my parents did find out, I was never allowed to go back uh, and spend time with my grandma because um, they didn't want it to happen. And so uh, grandma died before I had ever had a chance as a mature adult to sit down and, and share this with her. I did have an opportunity to talk to Uncle Fred, uh, who uh, had sexually molested me. And when I located him um, and, and called his wife at the time to find out if I could come and visit him, tragically, uh, I was, I was going to gently confront him about what he had done and the pain that it caused me because they told me in my recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction it was a good idea to sit down and, and not to beat, them, beat the person up, but just to confront them and ask them. When I notified um, his wife that I was coming and was set a date, sadly, he had a heart attack and died, which even caused me a little more pain. So I didn't get a chance. Any other questions? There's a hand back there. Yeah, uh, dad was an, an industrial salesman, uh, and he was on the road a lot, and he was a part-time police officer for the LAPD, because it was dur during the war, and a lot of the police officers were off fighting the war. Um, but once he found out what grandma was doing, um, he stuck pretty close to my side, but he was really tough. He was really tough. I really understood that. I, today, I don't blame him for that. Um, unfortunately, he died at a young age from cancer. I was only 20. So we never really got to spend some time around that. And that, that's, that was a sad moment. I spent his last days with him uh, before he died. I have a question, sir. Uh, you said you made decision while your kids were teenagers. Right. What was the actual talk to let them know you were no longer be a male anymore to go to a female? Boy, you know, that's, that's an embarrassing question Sorry. right there. Sorry. But that's a good question. Um, I didn't tell him. I just told him, your mom and I are going to get a divorce. And so I, with this duality, dissociative disorder with my kids. When I saw my kids after the divorce, I was always Walt. I never let my kids see me in my transgender persona because in my mind, I thought it was abuse. And I would never do that. Now, my daughter, when she found out about it, um, she didn't speak to me for eight years. Today, she calls me her hero. You made a great point about transgen transgenders not being homosexual, which is so important to us in North Carolina with our house, um, with a HB2 law. Um, and so, at the time that you were transitioning or going through this process, you were, you're saying that you were attracted to women still, mm -hmm. even as a woman, it, even dressing up and having the surgery right. and becoming Laura. Right, which makes the bathroom bill more dangerous. Right? Yes, sir. Absolutely more dangerous. Yeah, and, and we should, we should, Remember this, I didn't talk about it today, but 62 to 70% of all presenting transgenders suffer from AXIS-1 
psychological and psychiatric disorders that are never treated. And many of them are sexual fetishes. That's why the bathroom thing is really important. Men, I don't care what kind of dress they wear, I don't care how much they've been looking like a woman, keep them out of that bathroom. My man, buddy. Praise the Lord. You're right. I told you. I told you. Any more? I, w I wanted to add with the, um, when I asked you about your grandmother and grandmothers playing such a key part, because we see a lot of kids who are with their grandmothers and little boys and they have two earrings in their ear and, you know, they have piercings. So I thought it was just very interesting th about, you know, just the role that it plays in the mind, just how now today even the purple dress has taken you down this long road of life. And when grandparents and stuff let their, their boys do stuff that girls should that girls do, you know, what it leads to and how society looks at it and, and what it puts on the child, basically. Right. You know, the, the, the young mind is like a big sponge and it'll soak up absolutely everything you throw at it. And if we put in there something about an earring or looking like a female, it's going to stick. That's right. But if we develop them in a way that the father can only do with the mother's help, and affirm them as a male. Take them fishing, take them hunting, take them. We don't, we, we want to develop men. We want to develop men. I saw a bumper sticker not long ago. It said, so many males, too few men. We need more men. Another question. Well, sir, uh, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Mm -hmm. At the end of everything that you have said, I thought about that song, I Know What Prayer Can Do. There Praise the go. Lord. Yes, absolutely. Because prayer changed it. Prayer turned it around. You bet. And to God be the glory for that. Yep. Even when I was resisting, prayer worked. Yeah. All right. One more. All right. Yes, sir. There's a mic right here. If you could say one thing to Bruce Jim, what would you tell him? You're nuts. <laughs> 